Hello everyone and welcome to Mountain Lake Journal. I'm Tom Halleck. Coming up in just three weeks on March 1st, single-use plastic bags like this will be banned in New York State. The average household uses about 1,500 of these every year, mostly for groceries. That's 23 billion statewide, which adds up to a lot of plastic getting into our landfills and the environment. The ban on single-use plastic bags passed by the legislature last year aims to reduce plastic pollution across the state. Grocery store chain Wegmans in western New York has already banned single-use plastic bags and is now charging five cents for paper bags. Convenience stores like Stewart Shops are also following suit, announcing this past week on Facebook that they were beginning to phase out plastic bags as well. New York's Department of Environmental Conservation says it will distribute 250,000 reusable bags across the state this month to raise awareness about the ban that officially goes into effect on March 1st and in hopes of getting people used to the idea of bringing along reusable bags when they go shopping. And Commissioner Segos is with us now. It's good to see you. Welcome. Great to see you as well. Thanks for having me. So the new ban on plastic bags goes into effect March 1st. Most people prepared for this? We're, we're only uh, two or three weeks away and we're getting closer and closer. People mm -hmm. have heard about it, but are they ready for it? Yeah, I think you're right. People have heard about it. Certainly they heard about it when we passed the law um, last year. There's always a spike in awareness when you pass the law and then it sort of ebbs, awareness ebbs until the very end when the end is near and we're 30 days out now from, from the ban. Um, I think most people are aware it's coming. Most stores are, are prepared for this. You know, you see them starting to shift their stock and making plastic bags available, plastic reusable bags available, cloth re reusable bags available. Mm -hmm. Some have already gone that distance, like Wegmans have already, have already adopted the ban. Um, but over the next 30 days, we have work cut out for us. We're going to get around the state, uh, get the word out ab about this, remind people um, that they need to begin bringing reusable bags or get ready for paper bags. And uh, there's always a, a transition period when you put in a new law. Right, there's always a, a ramp up period of education. So my focus the first, um, the, the first few months of the, of the ban will be, let's continue the education. We'll leave enforcement until later. You know, just do send people around the state and doing uh, spot checks, quality control checks. And, and, uh, and I think people will, will adapt the, to this new, uh, new, new ban. So folks will have to get reusable bags, bring them with them to the stores, or they can, in some cases, will, will be offered paper bags. Correct. Uh, will most stores charge the five cent uh, fee for that? I, I assume so. I, I think they. I think they will because it does cost more to produce uh, a, pla a paper bag than it does a plastic bag. Um, I think you're going to see a mixture of of the two. Everywhere this has been done in the past, there's been um, you know good uptick in the use of truly reusable bags. Um, and people, um, you know, when they don't have those bags, having a paper alternative is perfectly acceptable. Uh, but the lo localities will be able to choose, you know, some can opt in to a fee also on paper. Uh, ultimately, the, the idea is not to transition everyone into paper, but transition everyone into reusables. And what's been the environmental threat? Are they piling up in the landfills or do they, are they finding mm -hmm. their way into the environment in other Good ways? Good question. We use 23 billion bags uh, in, in New York State that are single-use plastic bags. It's a huge number. And those are used for an average of about 11 minutes each, and they all go off to landfills. The ones that don't make it to landfills either get, for the wrong reasons, into recycling operations. They can shut down enough, enough of these single-use bags can actually shut down a recycling operation because they get stuck in all the wheels, mm. and they'll, they'll go offline for days while they do repairs. Or they end up you know, in farm fields, stuck in trees in urban areas, or they fall into streams. And what they do is they don't break, break down, they break up and they break up into little pieces. Ultimately, they get into the food chain. It's really high publicized, uh, highly publicized uh, incidences of, of uh, plastic in the Pacific and the Atlantic getting into our water supplies. Uh, unfortunately, plastic is everywhere at the micro level. And uh, it is an environmental problem. It's a human health problem. It's also an aesthetics problem. And some people may have assumed that they could be recycled. A perfect plastic bag that has no contamination in it if, put it, if put into the right stream, can be recycled. But it's very difficult to find that stream. I mean, many stores had these, these containers up front where you could drop your, your bag right. and I used to do that. 
but you know, all you all you need is one bag in that huge bin to be not recyclable, or to have a Coke can in it that's wet, or to have a banana peel, and the whole thing is garbage. So they are not very easily recyclable in, in practice. In, in in theory, they are. Um, so get away from the recycling operations. Get into reuse. And for people who wonder if they go to the grocery store and get their cold cuts and. Will plastic like that be banned as well? Will it, will it now be paper? Great question. So, no, there are significant exemptions within the ban uh, to allow uh, meats, cheeses, vegetables, things like that at grocery stores, people to continue using those bags because there's really no alternative, right? The governor in his state of the state this year talked about extending this now to cover single-use styrofoam. Mm -hmm. uh, he's hoping that the legislature will go along with that. Is that the next logical step? I, I believe it is the next logical step. Um, you already see a significant per percentage of the state already moving in that direction, or have a, has already moved in that direction. 60% of New York is already covered by those types of bans locally. Albany County, for example, you know, mm -hmm. you don't see Dunkin' Donuts selling styrofoam cups anymore. It's been like that for years, and consumers don't know the difference, right? You're just getting a cup of coffee. Um, styrofoam is this just like plastic bags. You know, once it gets out there into the landscape, it's not going away for generations. And since we're talking about the governor's uh, state of the state and his budget proposal, a uh, five-year plan, $33 billion mm -hmm. to tackle climate change. Still too early to know what shape that takes. In some ways, yes, but um, you know, last year we signed the nation's most aggressive climate change legislation. Uh, puts us on a path to be uh, largely carbon-free by 2040. Um, it's a really ambitious target. We've got to hit significant marks by 2030. Good to sign the law, great to say that you're committed, but what the governor's done is he's gone a step further and he's actually providing money uh, and contracts towards the renewable goals that we have to hit. So the $33 billion, we certainly know about some of that. Some of that's uh, now being programmed through NYSERDA, things like accelerating the installation of solar statewide, both large scale and small scale, uh, onshore and offshore wind, um, energy efficiency within buildings, electric vehicle um, stations, electric vehicle incentives. Um, it's a comprehensive plan. And part of that is the Bond Act also, the $3 uh -huh. billion dollar Bond Act. So it's an all-in approach. Um, and the governor's also talked about this, the speed at which permits, uh, 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 projects get permitted and get through the, and ultimately get to construction. That is part of this as well, right? We have to reform the system of permitting so that we get projects built faster to hit those targets. And you talk about the $3 billion Bond mm -hmm. Act. How would that help the Adirondacks? Sure, it's the $3 billion, proposed $3 billion, uh, Restore Mother Nature. Bond Act uh, that if, assuming we get through the legislature with it this year, uh, would go to the voters in November. We'd be asking them for uh, $3 billion to, to, to begin working on the landscape. Um, I believe it is a, it's a down payment, right? It's an, it's, it's, we have the incentive right now to spend money um, on, uh, on mitigation, adaptation, as opposed to having to spend it on damage res response in the future. You know, you see valleys, every, every hamlet is in a valley on a stream, uh, and there's a culvert and a bridge. Now we're seeing heavier storms coming through these kinds of valleys and literally wiping out communities. Um, so how do you adapt the landscape? You adapt it in some ways, it's quite logical. You just make wider uh, culverts underneath uh, or, or to, to allow waters okay. to flow without uh, you know, wiping out the bridge. And that has dual benefits, right? It has the benefit of restoring habitat. You allow fish to migrate more easily, create wetland space to slow the flow of water. It also has an infrastructure upside. You know, you're not sending DOT in there to rebuild a bridge every two years. So. Um, in our view, this is, this is something we'll be communicating out to the public uh, extensively over the coming weeks and certainly months, assuming this again gets through the ledge. Um, it, it, habitat restoration on streams, reconnecting thousands of miles of streams that are cut off by culverts or dams that mm -hmm. have been uh, uh, shut down. Um, thousands and thousands of acres of wetland restoration. Those wetlands perform so many benefits other than just the wetlands themselves. Again, flood attenuation and habitat. We're already seeing the effects of climate change in the Adirondacks. Uh, the winter seasons are changing. Mm. They're seeing that at Whiteface Mountain, Gore Mountain. Absolutely. And already adjustments being made to snowmaking and, and dealing with the, the change in, in the weather that we're seeing. How else is climate change impacting the Adirondacks? We know there's concern about moose, there's concern mm. about big nails thrush and mm -hmm. other songbirds that live in the, and nest in the high peaks. Right. But uh, what other ways is climate change right now impacting yeah, the Adirondacks? You mentioned the, the snow. Certainly that's a big one, not having snow in the winter. I mean, that's the economy, right? Skiing, snowmobiling, whatever it is. Um, uh, uh, my, my concern is, I mean, the statewide view of this is um, climate change is impacting New York already. It's not just the storms. 
Uh, we're seeing invasive species moving north, um, emerald ash borer, the hemlock, woolly adelgid, all these various invasive species that impact our trees. Um, that's something we're looking at very closely here in the Adirondacks because um, the Adirondacks was created to protect, effectively, to protect the watershed. If you start losing trees because of damaging insects that are tied to climate change, then you start losing water quality as well, and that's big for every community up here. Um, I mean, by far the largest and most immediate impacts is going to be on the weather side, you know, both the lack of snow and, and um, you know, our projections on what New York would look like in 2080. Um, it's somewhat scary when you're looking at the, the lack of snow cover and what that means. My thinking then pivots very quickly to what's coming in the spring, you know, spring fire season. So we're pivoting now to almost a, a preparedness for a fire season because of uh, the lack of snow. So there are real impacts to what's happening with, 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 with climate change. Uh, they play out uh, sometimes very visibly with fires, sometimes very subtly with the change in species uh, and how that impacts the landscape over time. Obviously a big concern in the Adirondacks right now is the overcrowding, the, mm -hmm. the, the use of the trails. People are loving the Adirondacks to death in some cases. Mm -hmm. It almost seems with the, with the crowds that are coming to use the popular trails. The state is working on that, mm -hmm. uh, working on trail restoration, working on things like shuttle buses. Correct. Those steps going to be enough to address the problem or are you looking at additional steps and more that needs to be done? I, I would reframe it not as a problem, but as, a, as a, uh, a real benefit. Right now, we have unprecedented interest in New York tourism, which is a great position to be in, right? When people want to come here, this movement, and this sort of local vor movement in a way, where people find their own backyards, people have realized that we have some of the most amazing places in the world right here. The trouble is now we're dealing with the side effects of it, right? And the, again, just like hamlets weren't built for severe weather, you know, New York over 100 years didn't build well, not in the Adirondacks, for the kind of tourism economy. Mm -hmm. So we have to, we have a sort of double-edged sword. We got to protect the back country. We have to protect the front country, but we also have to, um, you know, get our get our um, uh, our uh, folks into the back country safely. Give them places to park. Give them better places to go spend their money in, in villages and then protect the incredible landscape uh, up in the mountains. So I think we are doing an enormous amount right now. We're, we're preparing ourselves very well for the coming year uh, with the shuttle services you note. We have an advisory committee that get, that's giving us other, uh, other ideas, both short, medium, long term, um, on how to, uh, how to address this, this issue of, of usage, make it more sustainable, right? Turn it from a problem into something that's sustainable and really good. You ask any of the supervisors in the area, they love the traffic, they love the spending, and you know, the businesses are happy. Um, but yeah, I can't abide by massive crowds parked on narrow roads. It's just dangerous uh, to, to, to everyone that's coming here. If you're gonna come to New York, we wanna give you a good experience when you're here. Do you look at a permit system for a number of activities in the Adirondacks like you see in the Catskills? Would that help? Address I some don't believe of the that would help in the Adirondacks, and uh, I, I, I don't think we need to go to that extreme now or, or ever. If if we can work out getting people to the trailhead safely and back to their car safely, could an app be an answer down the road? I believe it will. I mean, the governor has said let's let's make sure we get cell co cell coverage statewide, and obviously in the Adirondacks that means cell coverage on the roads because mm -hmm. uh, you're never going to get it up way up in the backcountry. Um, but I think, you know, the cell phone, uh, the cell coverage initiative is going to help with that. We have as one of our medium term ambitions to, to put in place a really good cell uh, uh, app service so that you know where to park, right? How, is the parking lot at Marcy Field, is it full? Do I need to go to the next place to find the shuttle? So that'll be, uh, enable us to be smarter and, and ultimately put our, our staff in the position of educating at the trailhead as opposed to doing, you know, parking enforcement.